All right, welcome back. So next panel is called Financial Firms in the SEC's Crosshairs. And uh, a terrific panel. Let me start by introducing Adam Aderton, a uh, partner at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher in DC, where his practice focuses on regulatory enforcement matters and white collar defense. Until just a few months ago, Adam was the co-chief of the Asset Management Unit in the SEC's Division of Enforcement. Welcome, Adam. George Canellis is a partner at Millbank in New York. He's a global head of the firm's litigation and arbitra arbitration group. George was previously the co-director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. Uh, also an AUSA in the Southern District of New York, where he was chief of the Major Crimes Unit and part of the Securities and Commodities Fraud Task Force. George, great to have you with us. Very pleased to welcome Corey Schuster uh, from the SEC. He's an assistant director in the Enforcement Division and co-chief of the Asset Management Unit. He supervises investigations concerning investment advisors and all of the uh, different kinds of financial firms that we're gonna be talking about today. Welcome, thanks so much for joining us. And Bill White is a partner at Allen & Overy uh, in its DC office. Bill's experience includes representing clients in SEC, FINRA, and related criminal investigations, as well as internal investigations and securities litigation. He served for eight years in the Enforcement Division as a staff attorney, a branch chief, and a senior trial counsel. Bill, great to have you. Finally, our moderator is Greg Brew. Uh, Greg is a partner and the founder of the Brew Law Group in Washington, D.C. And of course, Greg previously served for 12 years and was an assistant director in the Enforcement Division. Uh, Greg, let me turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, well, we have, we have one important mandate, which is we're not gonna be boring. So uh, we recognize this is the low blood sugar part of the afternoon. We're gonna try to move things along here, talk about asset managers, talk about broker dealers. First, we should let Corey say what he has to say. Yeah, just a general disclaimer that I have to give. Uh, any thoughts that I share today are my own and not necessarily those of uh, the commission, the commissioners, or any of the staff. And, and, and I will steal a line from the great Larry Ergenson and say, I speak for all free-thinking people everywhere. <laughs> so just so we get the preliminaries out of the way. So um, obviously, um, asset managers are a, a huge and growing business. Um, you know, when we've seen the growth of this industry, and some of the numbers are staggering, 15,000 registered investment advisors, $128 trillion under management, 64 million clients, and growing uh, as, we, as we speak. Um, broker dealers, on the other hand, to the extent you can still delineate where that line is, there are 612,000 registered reps, there's 3,400 registered firms with FINRA um, with uh, annual turnover of about $150 billion. So enormously important um, over the course of my time as a securities lawyer, I've seen it become more and more the focus of enforcement. It's, it's gone from being a very specialized niche kind of practice, uh, dealing with bucket shops, to dealing with the most sophisticated market participants uh, nationally, internationally. So um, like most of these panels, uh, the, the person who is most at interest is the current senior SEC person on the panel who's only speaking from his personal vantage point about things like what, that, what the year was like for the SEC. So, Corey, could you start and give us some, some sense of what the highlights were from your vantage point from the SEC's year? Sure, and I'll, I'll probably speak more about like the asset management unit and you know, core cases that really flow from that. Um, you know, the results came out today. I think there was a press release on it, so I encourage everyone to take a look if, to the extent they haven't seen that already. Uh, but from our perspective, um, we had the Infinity Q matter where we filed a complaint against the CIO of Infinity Q and allege a mismarking scheme that overvalued assets by about $1 billion while taking millions of dollars of fees. Uh, there's the Archegos matter uh, involving a family office where we allege that um, the founder and certain others engaged in a market manipulation and misrepresentations with respect to certain counterparties. Uh, we brought our first case involving a registered investment advisor uh, for violations of the Advisors Act involving a SPAC, where certain personnel, there were failures to disclose, conflicts of interest, uh, misleading statements related to uh, management's um, uh, interests in a SPAC sponsor and then the fund investing in affiliated SPACs. And then just one last one to, to sort of flag on the retail front, 
um, is there is a there was a case back in June of 2022 uh, involving Schwab where we charged three uh, Schwab subsidiaries that were investment advisors to robo advisor clients uh, where they allocated client funds to cash in a manner that their own internal data showed was inconsistent or would underperform the market in most conditions and the cash was allocated to an affiliated bank. So those are just a flavor of some of the cases that that the, that the unit, the core has brought this year related in this area. So, so how large is the unit? The unit is, uh, it's a good question. Uh, there's approximately 50 people in the unit um, across you know, 10 offices. Um, involving attorneys, supervisors, industry experts, but we work closely with other members of the division, the other divisions as well, um, particularly examinations, that's no secret, and the Division of Investment Management. So can you uh, give us a little bit of a uh, prediction of what the year ahead would look like in terms of priorities for enforcement priorities? Yeah, I mean, I think for, you know, I would say our areas of interest um, mm -hmm. in the unit, you know, they overlap mm -hmm. largely what you probably have heard from the commission and, you know, examinations. You know, private funds obviously is, a, is an area of interest for our unit. Um, there are issues related to valuation, fees and expenses, and a host of other areas. Um, you know, we're interested in this area. Not surprisingly, you were just describing some of the growth. That area has seen a lot of growth in terms of the number of advisors, the number of clients, the number of funds. Uh, the number of a the amount of AUM in that area, um, ESG, um, that's another area of interest for us. Again, attracting lots of a mm -hmm. assets. It's been an explosion of growth there. Um, record numbers of funds that came out in 2020 and again in 2021. And we we look to ESG with you know traditional principles of are people doing what they say they're doing? You know, do they have policies or policies and procedures in place? You know, to comply with their representations. Uh, and then lastly, I'd say conflicts, which is a perennial issue, and that relates to you know, each of our core areas, which we talked about earlier, private funds, um, registered funds, and then retail clients as well. So um, one question that I had, um, in an area such as ESG, on the one hand, people say we're, we're applying traditional standards. We're not really making new law. We're applying traditional disclosure standards here. If that's the case, why do we have a special emphasis on it? Why do we devote new staff to it? Why do we have task forces on it? Why is this not just Disclosure 101? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it is, a lot of it is Disclosure 101. A lot okay. of it is it's just, it's, a, it's an increase in assets that, you know, is attracting a lot of investor interest. It's attracting a lot of advisor interest. And we want to, you know, when we're looking at disclosures like we would in other manners, yeah. are people doing what they say they're doing with respect to ESG? So a lot of the tr traditional principles that you say, you talk about Disclosure 101, you know, those apply equally to, to ESG. Okay. Um, and I would note that we heard from, like, on, the, on the previous panel, we're not going to spend a lot of time on ESG, but there was a previous uh, person who said, well, when you talk to the commission about ESG, you should assume that if it's required disclosure, we think it's material, right? So you're starting out from a materiality basis. So um, obviously that's not a fight you, you, you probably want to fight on behalf of a reg regulated entity. Uh, Adam, could you uh, talk a bit about um, all the things that Corey couldn't say since you <laughs> just left as a co-head of the asset management unit, but maybe talk about exam priorities and how those might, what those are and how those might affect the enforcement docket going forward. Sure. Um, first, thanks, Greg. And I'm glad Corey identified the issues uh, in terms of private funds and ESG. Those are the first two priorities that are listed in the exam priorities that came out in March. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me about the priorities from exam is that they uh, are pretty similar to things we've seen in the past, but we've seen elevation of particular issues uh, and a reordering of issues. And so private funds has risen to the top, just like it's risen to the top across this commission for uh, exam, for Corey, and also for uh, the rulemaking in IM. Um, same with ESG. Outside of those issues, uh, the other, and I'll come back to specific issues in each of them, Reg BI was called out for broker-dealers. And uh, there were specific focuses for retail registered investment advisors on the issues where we've seen a lot of SEC enforcement cases over the last few years. So revenue sharing, share class issues, wrap fee issues, those kinds of things. Um, drilling down a little bit into the private funds, all of the issues that Corey mentioned are in those priorities. So things like fees and expenses, valuation, 
uh, compliance programs, custody, which Grabeer mentioned today, the, sweep, the custody sweep that the SEC put out at the end of the 2022 fiscal. I think one of the things that's interesting to me when I look at the private fund priorities is that the SEC seems to be anticipating uh, something happening in the economy or maybe reacting to something happening in the economy because some of the issues that they call out include post-commitment period write-downs for private equity, um, which is something that the SEC will focus on when they anticipate that some of those companies are gonna be overvalued. Um, similarly, preferential liquidity for some funds that are experiencing liquidity challenges. That's another thing that the SEC often looks at when they think the market cycle uh, uh, might change. One more issue, advisor-led restructurings for private funds. So this is something that often happens in the context of private equity if you're looking at continuation funds or, uh, or other issues uh, around end of life cycle for closed-end funds. So I think it's interesting how private funds have been elevated, how they're foreshadowing some of these factors that you see in what could be a down market for private fund investments. We've already covered ESG. On the retail side, one thing I wanted to ask Corey, and I actually caught up with him in the hallway. So do you, you know, we see these retail priorities with respect to share class, wrap fees, um, revenue sharing. I can't, I've, this is my fourth or fifth time at this conference, and I've talked about these things for four or five years. Um, are we gonna see more cases about share class? Yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, our response, I, I hope not as many. I think you'll see that they've, you know, we haven't been bringing as many of those, and I'm hoping that's because the conduct um, has corrected it. But we'll have to see. I can't really predict, you know, what is actually happening in the industry. We just, we, we respond where we see misconduct. And then, you know, as you know, over the last five years, we've seen a lot of share class issues, revenue sharing issues uh, relating to money market funds, cash sweep products, and things of those nature. So do you, um, Reg BI came out a couple of years ago. And there was uh, you know, a, a long and very public process to get that, get that through. Um, we saw the first enforcement case during uh, this past year. Uh, does any, anybody want to talk a bit about Reg BI and what sort of is on the, on the horizon for that? Because uh, the, the case that came out was one that looked to me like uh, it could have been a case. It didn't need Reg BI to bring that case. It looked like a traditional suitability case, though. It did have an additional compliance uh, portion there for the Western International Securities, I think was the name of the, uh, the firm. Does anyone want to talk about, the, anybody want to uh, grab a hold and talk a bit about what Reg BI means to, no? I'll talk. Yeah, you will. <laughs> George will sure. talk about almost anything. <laughs> I think I think Reg BI actually has dramatically changed the law as it relates to to uh, broker dealers. Um, it used to be that if you looked at um, suitability cases, you'd see FINRA suitability cases, and a lot of SEC cases would be characterized as suitability cases. But every time you'd go to, let's say, a jury instruction or a motion to dismiss standard, the standard always was you need to prove that unsuitable securities were sold and that material misrepresentations were used in connection with the purchase or sale of securities. So you were left saying, well, if I need to prove a material misstatement, what, what suitability have to do with it? But now, post-reg BI, it certainly does. And I think the Western, the, the Western International uh, case, um, I think, really proves the point. I mean, now, now reg BI basically says that if you're a broker dealer and you're making recommendations, first your recommendation needs to be in the best interest of your client, which is a, an asset management like fiduciary standard. Um, but then second, you need to have made disclosure of all material information. Mm -hmm. So that's again, that's sort of an asset management like standard. And then you need to have discharged a duty of care and you need to have policies and procedures that are reasonably designed to discharge all of the above. So the standards walks and squawks a lot like an asset management standard when you listen to those elements. But when you actually read this case, the, the allegations in the complaint that was filed, it, it's a contested case. What was interesting is that a lot of those duties that in a traditional broker dealer are placed on the shoulders of the broker dealer are placed according to the allegations of the complaint on the individuals themselves. So for example, you kind of had a classic big broker dealer setting in which a research department carefully vets different products and decides which products can be placed on the platform and which products are generally suitable for the kinds of clients who are served 
by the firm. Here, though, the charge was against the firm and individuals, and in each case, the SEC alleges that the, the individual broker-dealers should have been engaging in a process in which they carefully vetted and came to understand the product in a way that the research department did, but they didn't, um, and that required a, a, a very exacting standard of care. You sort of come away from reading the case thinking, if I'm a broker-dealer, I might as well just jettison the whole model and go with an IA model because it'd be probably easier to comply with the well-established standards for an IA. And just to add a point, a coda to, to the coming together of the standards that George is talking about, the SEC has put out two pieces of guidance this year that talk about a broker's dealer and advisor's deal, uh, an, a broker's obligations and an advisor's obligations in the same piece of guidance. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and the chair even mentioned them today and treated them together. And so it really is a question whether there is a, a coming together of what the SEC expects from, from these standards. And I, I do think as you... Um, as you sort of go forward, we got those cases could have been brought, I think. Uh, it would seem on the facts as a traditional yeah. uh, fraud case, as you said, but I do think you're going to see cases that sort of drift away from that and are less than maybe a, uh, a traditional fraud case. And I think it's, I think it's going to become part of the, of, of the agency's docket, um, looking at these situations where um, there just has been sort of big disregard of the, of the Ultimate investment. And you also have an explicit requirement to manage conflicts. And, and you wonder whether the traditional broker-dealer model is just not viable. Um, I think in that case, mm -hmm. in that case, the broker-dealer made a three and a half, I think it was three and a half percent commission, if my memory serves, on each sale. And, and the registered rep received between 85 and 90 percent of it. And obviously, um, you know, the SEC regarded that conflict as not just having been inadequately disclosed, but perhaps just inadequately managed. Mm -hmm. And if you have differential pay for differential products, which is kind of why the right. broker dealer model still exists, and you give a certain percentage payout to your people, they're always going to have an incentive to tout the products and recommend the products that have better P&L for them. Yeah, and I think this is, this is going to be particularly hard on those firms that routinely do give payouts to the salespeople of 85 or 80 percent. Um, I think this is something that's going to just repeat in uh, in case after case. So, Bill, we have a, a Reg BI imposes a specific obligation um, to have compliance programs, policies, procedures, things like that. So, do you anticipate going forward we will see standalone policies and procedures enforcement cases? In other words, not in the context where you've got a failure, where you've got, you know, you've got a suitability issue, you've got a sales issue, but just standalone coming from the exam process or, or otherwise. I think you could um, because you've got particular products that have certain attributes that uh, where the product may not be suitable for whole classes of people. Uh, and if the policies and procedures aren't specifically tailored uh, to cover that particular product, I think there's, I think you are going to have um, at least the potential for the SEC to bring cases. It would seem to me not being at the SEC uh, anymore, uh, but it would seem to me to be smart to bring those cases to kind of send the message that, um, you know, this, this is what we expect. We expect tailored policies and procedures um, to the products that directly address the risks of those products. So it's, <clears throat> so it's starting to sound like um, a little bit like, uh, and maybe I've been a defense lawyer too long, that this is something that should be in a deficiency letter, right? Should be sort of the subject to the exam process. Um, I don't know that that's the case, and I don't know if that's too extreme, but, but I, I would like to ask, Corey, if you could speak to it, how the relationship is between the division of examinations and division of enforcement. Because there's always been, there's been a lot of talk over the years, as long as there was an OC before this and a division of examinations, every conference enforcement says we work hand in glove with inspections and examinations. But how, how is that relationship now? Yeah, I mean, I think we've, we've got a great relationship with the division of examinations. Um, you know, as Adam was referencing earlier, a lot of, a lot of what they're seeing becomes our, become our priorities or our interests. They're the, the eyes and the ears of, 
of what the agency is seeing out in the advisory world, in the broker-dealer world. A lot of the risks that are percolating up, they're the first ones to see. And so, you know, where we think we should be active is informed, and where we think the risks are is informed by what the division of examinations is seeing. Um, you know, they also have their own mandate, which is, you know, like you said, in certain instances, deficiency letters do rise to the level of enforcement, and mm -hmm. we have that dialogue with them. In other situations, that's not going to be the case, and it's a very facts and circumstances matter. Um, but, you know, we certainly have a dialogue with them about, you know, where we think they should be active, and they have the same dialogue with us about where they think we should be active. Does the, does the information flow from enforcement to examinations with any frequency? In other words, are there instances where enforcement has said, we think it would be important for the exam teams to look for the following kinds of conduct, the following kinds of issues? I mean, you know, I don't want to get in too much into the actual discussions with them, but I mean, I think you can assume that we do have discussions. If we see something in an enforcement matter, we'll bounce it off of them, something that we think is some, yeah. you know, egregious and could have a wider industry implications. Is it something they've seen or seeing? Um, you know, so there, there, are, there are dialogues that are along those lines. So let me, let me ask this, Adam, you're um, new to private practice um, and, and welcome. <laughs> Thank you. What, yeah, great to be here. And I'm going to ask, ask uh, He's going to ask and, you for beer. And George yeah. and Bill, too. Um, <laughs> when would you advise your clients to get involved in an examination? Like, what are the, what are the circumstances under which you, as an enforcement lawyer, or as a, as a counselor, because your clients don't identify as an enforcement lawyer so much as a counselor, or you would let the examination run its usual course, which is the compliance staff at the, at the registered entity, the interviews, walk the hallways, all those things that an exam staff does on site. When, when, when would you, as outside counsel, think lawyers need to be involved in this process? I think it's in most registrants' interest to have lawyers aware of the process from the day mm -hmm. the first letter comes in, uh, so that they can carefully monitor everything that's being asked and everything that's being said. Uh, my sense, um, I haven't been gone that long, but my sense is that the bar for what moves from examination to enforcement um, changes over time, and that right now clearing that bar takes less than maybe it took five years ago. And if that's the case, uh, I think it's worthwhile for registrants to think very early about bringing their counsel up to speed, and then when things, we, we, I think you can tell when the context of an exam changes from an environment of, of, of information gathering to an environment of concern, and, mm -hmm. and I think at that point you, you've sort of got to go full in with counsel, and I think the reason for that is once something crosses over from the exam side to the enforcement side, you are in a, uh, a much more challenging uh, environment. Something like 10% of exams end up being enforcement referrals historically. Mm -hmm. And so if you were talking about a situation where you were in that 10%, um, you know, the game is already, you're already behind in the game. Right. It, to, to, to that point, it's both a happy and sad occasion when I read an exam letter for the first time uh, and see that there are issues in there. It's, it's right. sad for the client, happy maybe for me, <laughs> um, but um, uh, in, in a strange way. But, uh, but it's, but, and you look at it and you say, well, gee, couldn't something have been done during the exam, should have this just been remediated immediately um, while the staff was either still there or while it was still open before any decisions had been made. And so I do think it's, I agree, it's completely it's important to have counsel in the process, not necessarily interacting with, with, mm -hmm. the, uh, with the exam staff, but uh, it, it, depending on the issue, but in the process. and trying to identify those situations where, you know, maybe there is an issue here and we can take care of it pretty quickly and, and hopefully keep this away from enforcement. Well, uh, and Adam, as, uh, I just wish you in your decades ahead of, in private practice that all of your clients let you know as soon as there's an exam in your process. <laughs> yeah. My experience is sometimes they do and sometimes you find out when you read the letter. Yeah. They say, oh yeah, we didn't want to run up the fees or anything like that. Right. Um, George, you were the, when you were um, head of the New York office, you kind of had your foot in both places. How did you see the line between examinations and enforcement? I saw it as fairly seamless, honestly. Um, I mean, in order to ensure that they were, that those two branches of, 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 of SEC practice were welded well together, we would, um, I mean, I, I would attend 
monthly meetings of the exam staff, supervisors, to go over every exam. And we'd do a round robin mm -hmm. going through the exams to see which ones, if any, needed to be moved to enforcement in real time. Um, and then we would have an exam referral monthly meeting as well between the supervisors on the exams team and the supervisors on the enforcement staff, including, you know, in New York's a big office, so it always had representation of the units as well, like Bruce Carpati and people like that. Yeah. Um, just to make sure that anything that worthy worthy of worthy of um, of referral was referred, and also it, I think it it um, you know we would have the kind of dialogue that Corey's alluding to, but not prepared to talk about in great detail, <laughs> which is once in a while, especially if you have a big exam staff, you'll see something in the market or hear something on a referral that you think, mm, you know, it's maybe a little bit of smoke, mm. um, but you don't know if it's fire and you don't really want to commence an enforcement investigation and it's within the regulated community. So you suggest a cause exam or you suggest sort of a look-see from a lower, lower pressure standpoint from the exam standpoint. Um, and you'll often get a lot quicker information that way. If you start an enforcement investigation, you're going to have everyone lawyered up. You're going to need to make formal yeah. document requests and have a month to six week lead time. Whereas if exam calls, you'll usually get some basic information very quickly. And maybe that basic information will allay your concerns mm -hmm. and you've used your, asset, your assets efficiently and you move on. So have any of you had the experience where uh, a client's going through an exam and uh, you get a call in the morning where they say, we just found out that someone from enforcement is going to be present at the interviews that we had scheduled. Does that still happen? Well, you haven't had it happen. I haven't had it happen, but I will tell you that in my knowledge, exam enforcement participates in exams for a few different reasons. Um, sometimes it's just training. Uh, sometimes it's because there's a concern. But I think it's fair to assume that anything you say to exam is going to go to enforcement at some point anyway. And so you should be taking the same precautions, whether the enforcement lawyer is literally sitting there or the examiner you know, hangs up the phone and calls the enforcement the lawyer. The exam really later. shouldn't be doing interviews. You know, they, that they do. They can talk to your compliance <laughs> staff. You can talk in a big conference yeah, yeah, yeah. room. But as soon as they say, I want to sit down and talk to the, you know, your head of equities, yeah. uh, I think that's. That's the trigger for lawyers to politely say no, I uh, tend to think. Yeah, but you know, there's one, there's one commission. Well, at any rate, yeah. so, so just one parenthetical. When I was a new staff attorney uh, working for the, the great Jerry Eisenberg, I had, this is the days before the internet and before electronic records, but there was a bucket shop and the guy just said, we have so many subpoenas lined up, it's going to be a month before I can even get to yours. And so, I, not, not knowing any better, I said, Jerry, can I conduct a cause exam? And he said, yeah, sure, nobody does that for enforcement, but it's, you know, it's one commission, go ahead and do it. So I conducted a cause exam as a staff attorney in enforcement. <laughs> and uh, and I, it's, I think it's totally legal, I think it's totally unorthodox and very reckless. I'm sure. I, would, <laughs> I never, as a supervisor, I would never have let somebody do that. But, I'm sure uh, no one noticed, <laughs> I'm sure no one recognized you as an enforcement lawyer. When you're I, I, I told them I was an enforcement lawyer. You know, I, I, they, they knew. I didn't get the windbreaker. I wanted the windbreaker. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about something that um, is also in the category of things that maybe in a different era uh, might have been dealt with uh, as an exam matter. Let's talk about the off-channel communications cases that resulted in skewing the numbers for penalties dramatically. <laughs> um, but let's talk about that. Corey, could you describe what, what happened in those, those cases? I mean, we probably all mostly know, but, but beyond that sort of give us a sense of why they were important. Yeah, I mean, just to set the stage, I think everybody's fairly familiar. We brought a case against J.P. Morgan Securities in December of 2021 for widespread failures to preserve electronic communications. Um, J.P. Morgan admitted to a variety of federal securities law violations, and we're the commission imposed a $125 million penalty, which I think shows the seriousness with which the commission is taking these actions. And then 16 additional ones came in um, September, including one investment advisor. And I think it's just, it just shows the, the commitment that the agency has to these regulations. They are, they're fundamental, they're bedrock, they go to the integrity of the markets, and they really go to the ability of exam and investigations to, to fulfill, their, fulfill their missions. Um, and 
you know, these, these aren't new regulations. Um, it's not a new mode of communication. Texting's been around for 10 years. It's not the first form of electronic communication. Uh, and e indeed, each of these firms had, you know, policies and procedures on these specific areas, but didn't, didn't implement them. Um, and so, you know, the widespread failures went to senior levels. So I think that's, that's why you're seeing um, the penalties where they are, uh, longstanding, um, misconduct in this area. So um, I'm going to ask a little bit about that, but before we before we really sort of unpack this, let's talk a little bit about sort of where it leads. Because one of the things that if you read those settled orders, you see, with a couple of exceptions, you see mostly fairly you know modest sampling in relation to the size of the institution. You see fairly widespread violation. You don't hear that it is designed to be a subterfuge or a fraud or a scheme, otherwise the charges would be, would be different and the money would probably differentiate itself. Um, one, if, if you assume that there's that kind of level of, mis of, of lack of compliance from this fairly small strata that's been sampled among the biggest firms, wouldn't that suggest that it's an industry-wide problem? So one question is, how does the SEC deal with the rest of the industry, right? We've, we've already said there are 3,000 FINRA registered broker dealers. And, or is the interim effect of these sanctions enough? And two, where do we get to this larger cohort of registered investment advisors who have different but overlapping broker dealer or overlapping records requirements? So, Corey, maybe you could talk about the, the first piece of this, which is how do you think about this in terms of? If you have an industry-wide compliance program and you've now taken action, imposed sanctions, required a compliance consultant for the largest participants, but not the regional banks, not, not many others. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to comment necessarily on anything that's okay. not public and where we may be headed. I, I would say that, um, you know, if you look at the J.P. Morgan order, you know, as far as like the severity, and I think yeah. you said there, you know, the, there's no allegation of fraud. I think you can see in that order that, you know, in investigations, in active investigations, you know, records were called for that weren't produced, that were highly relevant and responsive for over a year. Others were deleted or destroyed. And so there is a, while there are no allegations of necessarily like fraud in those orders, mm -hmm. there, is al there are allegations that these may have impacted investigations. Yeah. And so I think that is why you're seeing the seriousness with which this commission is taking these records. That's part of the reason. It, you know, I mean, one of the, if you just look at the orders, um, you, you can get the point that, that um, we're talking about, which is the, the there seems to be an industry-wide uh, problem. Um, the real, to me, the real question isn't the cases themselves, it's what's everyone else supposed to do now? Um, it's, it's kind of a mess, and so we've had lots of questions, and if you think about the people involved, you've got small firms, regional firms, other national firms that haven't been charged or don't have a subpoena, international firms with varying degrees of U.S. presence, asset managers, you've got this whole uh, bucket of people looking at, at these cases saying, okay, what do we do now? And it's kind of easy from the SEC standpoint to say, well, what you do is you follow the, the rules and uh, you know, collect and review the communications. Of course, that's right, but it gets more complicated um, than that. I mean, everyone should be doing that, looking at their policies and procedures, figuring out what their own people are doing whether it's through surveys and interviews and um, working with IT, a whole bunch of different ways to figure out uh, what is um, what people are doing, figure out what you can deal with and co collect, preserve, review, and what you can't, and then set policies accordingly. I think people know to do that. The question that, that we get a lot is, well, what do you do then? Right, I mean, um, I mean, all all those things should be done already, uh, for uh, because the SEC may right. be calling soon. Um, but but what do you do? Do you go back? You know, if you've got a problem, and sort of how do you handle that? So I think that area is a little bit of a mess, and I, I kind of wish that the the commission would have come out with a 21A report or staff guidance or something um, that would have that would have sort of laid out 
um, what the next steps should be, because I think there's going to be some differentiation. Yeah, one, one of the things that makes it makes it especially hard is by the very nature of the misconduct means it may not be amenable to being detected in the examination process, right? So the sort of first line of the commission's awareness, they can go look at the, book, the, the books and records, et cetera, et cetera, unless they're looking at specific communications where somebody says something stupid, like let's take this to WhatsApp, or let's take this to Signal, right? The equivalent of you know, dating my experience back to analog age when you'd see the tapes that would say, call me on my private line. Right back when broker dealer lines were taped, but that's probably not going to happen. So I, I I agree with you. It's a it's a real problem. I think to some extent. And again, I'm, this is just a, my opinion here. The dollar amounts were extraordinary. The dollar amounts from the and then you add in the CFTC. You add in the shoes that may not have completely dropped from banking regulators and others. And this is a very expensive exercise for the banks. But it also feels like the kind of thing that something had to get their attention because you can't know what you can't know. When the documents are missing, you, you can say, well, maybe they, who, who's to say they were important documents for an investigation? You can't prove that. The banks can't prove that. Everybody is now incentivized to get it right, and they know that the cost of getting it wrong is prohibitive. So, you know, maybe don't cry for those big banks, but that's a real number. It takes You can look at the, you know, the profit margins for those banks and see how much revenue had to be generated to pay Two hundred million dollars a piece in penalties. George, are you? Can you speak anything about where this might be going for this uh, shifting line as to investment advisors and other uh, uh, regulated entities that have record keeping requirements? Well, I think it has been publicly reported that there is a sweep of certain asset managers as well, large large ones. A variety of large ones um, have been included in that sweep. So. I assume that the, um, the staff's plan is to take an approach in that sweep that's similar to the one that they took in the broker-dealer sweep. And I, I think there's um, you know, a lot that can be said about that sweep. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do, you, do you think that the, I mean, Bill, going back to your, your question, saying the industry is in a conundrum, is, the, is it primarily an education remedy? Is it a punishment remedy? That, that is needed to get industry conduct to conform to the record keeping requirements? Well, it, I mean, it really seemed, I mean, as, as you said, the, the uh, texts are not new, WhatsApp is not yeah. new. Yeah. Um, things were going along and, and people were sort of happy to, for the most part, it seems, to keep things going the way they'd been going and not change um, uh, what they were doing. Uh, look, I, I, um, I think an education piece is part of this, is part of remediation at most firms, um, and I do, think, I do think the penalties have had the intended uh, impact, and they could have people's attention. Um, and uh, the, the real issue is, uh, what does it mean? Okay, you have their attention, everyone should be fixing this going forward. I presume if you don't fix it on a going forward basis, you're gonna have a real yeah. problem. Um, but then, the, then the, the real issue, I think, is, is looking back. Do you, do you, what do you do looking back? Um, one of the first questions that I've asked when we've gotten calls from clients is, to, to the point that, that Corey made, had, have you had any um, DOJ or SEC investigations over the last few years where this could be an issue? Because I think you've got to figure out what you're going to do about that uh, if, if, um, uh, if you've had those. And then, you know, but, but even beyond that, the question is, do you look back? You might not want to look back from a human nature point of view, uh, but do you, do you yeah. have to? Well, I mean, you'll have 95% non-compliance, right? That's kind of what it is, about 95% right. non-compliance. Um, and um, look, I, I, I respect the SEC's concern about compliance with this rule, it's never, never, never something that should be overlooked when you have violations of rules, but I think this whole thing is blown out of proportion in such a big way. <laughs> I just, it's staggering um, to me. Um, you, I mean, look, most of the time when we investigate violations of the law, including criminal investigations, you're not dealing with regulated entities, but you're dealing with, let's say, public companies. None of them have any kind of preservation requirements, period. 
then most of the time, if you're coming up with a set of rational preservation requirements, you require preservation of those records that are vital to the operations of the company. So you have a lot of regs that have very coherent requirements. We need to make sure that we've maintained a record of every investment advisory agreement that we entered into with our clients. We need to maintain a host of financial records to show our security and our compliance with customer protection rules. But you know, we have these ancient regs that barely are coherent, like the one that's being forced here says, if you happen to have a written communication relating to the broker dealer's business as such, with no <laughs> definition of business as such, well, you need to preserve it. It's written in an era before the internet, before text messaging, before you could dictate a message to someone with the same readiness as you have a call to them. And unlike FCA regs, which require certain communications on certain topics to be recorded so that you're making a record, this just says, you don't have to make a record of anything, but if you happen to be, if you happen to do it in writing, you can talk about it all you want, but if you happen to do it in writing, you need to preserve it. So they're not very good records to start out with, but just, you know, I think what you saw when you, if you were part of those investigations is within the rarest of rare instances, you would see disturbing conduct. Rarest of rare, I don't think you can find it at any of the big banks, but a disturbing would be you're doing something nefarious, you don't want this communicated on, on the firm's you know, official channels because you know it will be preserved. Nefarious conduct, that's rare. Usually it's just a matter of convenience, especially during COVID, but even without COVID, because of the revolution in telecommunications that we've had, um, and especially when you're just dealing with the human reality that if I have client relationships, I'm dealing with people who know me well and whose birthday parties I may attend, mm -hmm. uh, and those are also people I may do business with, my colleagues, my clients. They have my cell phone number, and they text me on my cell phone number, or out of convenience, I text them. And I think you can fault the firms for not equipping people with enough technology to allow them to, pres to have those kinds of communications. Um, you know, we're also dealing with, to do business in Latin America, it has to be on WhatsApp. To do it in China, it has to be WeChat. Right now, we still don't have a system that will preserve WeChat. WhatsApp, they're just, mm -hmm. just developing. So these are very challenging. And, and I think we all know regulators are just as guilty of having these kind of conversations and communications of convenience on text messages outside of, let's mm -hmm. say, SEC channels. I've seen it myself. Mm -hmm. um, not for nefarious purposes. So I just think in terms of proportionality, these, the penalties that we've seen in this, in this matter, they're unacceptable, but, really, just so, unacceptable. So, so I'm, yeah, I'm I getting would, this as a Corey in his yeah, personal yeah. I, I would just push yeah. back yeah. a little on that. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't think this was pandemic created. I mean, texting goes back a long way. Each of these orders had conduct that predates the pandemic. You know, did the pandemic maybe exacerbate it? Maybe in part. But I think it also relates to, as let's set forth in the J.P. Morgan, there were requests for documents. There were, you know, subpoenas are issued. I mean, people should be paying attention to this issue outside of just even this particular context. If your clients get a subpoena and for biz, and you're getting a subpoena for records, I think you need to look at each of these firms had had policies and procedures, like the certifications that said, I don't maintain text messages. These aren't one-off communications. These are widespread failures. And so maybe the bulk of them don't have any sort of implication. But because of their widespread nature, the, the fact that, that there are so many of them, even if it's a small percentage that are nefarious, that do implicate things that regulators want to look at, that do uh, hide misconduct out there, those are records that really are important and really are fundamental to what we do and to our, the, per, the integrity of our markets. And I, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with that. But I'm just saying a, a really interesting thought exercise would be to take this august group of defense lawyers and take them back in time two years. And if you'd said to them, you know, um, like a lot of people are text messaging from time to time. Everyone basically uses work email for work stuff. But from time to time, they text message. Sometimes it's just, I'm going to be late to a meeting, mm -hmm. but a business meeting. And sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's something substantive, like we're doing an investment banking pitch, and I want to be able to talk to my team real time. So I set up a chat service so I can mm -hmm. email them, text message them, because I'm on the go. I'm not at my computer. 
like that happens, and what that means is technically people aren't preserving records relating to business as such. Um, and that's for broker dealers. IA have a totally different set of record keeping requirements. Don't know why it's different. But if you said, well, we, well, the SEC is going to bring a case, what will the penalty be? Like, we would have said right. Morgan Stanley case was 10 million. It's, you know, right. I don't know. Point of monitor, do, some, do, do, do a, do a post order. Yeah. But, but they got their attention. And one of the things I didn't hear you True. say, George, was that the industry was unaware of the requirement. You said that the rules and regulations are archaic and don't really fit the modern reality. But in terms of the compliance obligation, I that, think, that wasn't murky. Yeah, and I'm not saying that the approach, the right approach was necessarily a 21A report, but it's interesting, Bill's, I mean, it's sort of, yeah. it, it, there might have been an argument that they should have had a speech saying we're deeply disturbed, or an exam priority, or a 21A there, report as a warning. I think there was a risk alert. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. There. Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, you, you kept your promise. It was not boring. <laughs> Thank you. Great job, Greg.